Welcome everyone to Software Architecture by Example. <clears throat> you see Mark Richards smiling face there as well, even though he's not here today because he and I put this material together. And in fact, one of the things that we talk about a lot is iterative design and architecture, but we also iteratively design uh, course materials and books. And this is actually the uh, end result of that process because Several years ago, almost 10 years ago now, Mark and I started looking around and realized that there was a number of salary surveys that software architect was one of the most desirable jobs in a lot of different countries, but there was no real good curriculum of how do you become not, from not a software architect to becoming a software architect. And so he and I put together a, a bunch of workshops that we did at conferences like this, and that eventually led to this book, Fundamentals of Software Architecture. But along the way of building this book, we also generated a lot of instructional material. And one of the things that we realized is that different people have different learning modes. Uh, Mark and I had produced a while back a series of streaming videos for O'Reilly, our publisher, because some people like watching streaming videos. In fact, one of the weirdest things that ever happened to me is I was in a hotel gym in some random country and somebody came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder and held up his iPad and it was me on the iPad, and he said, is that you? And I said, yeah, but what is that? And it was one of the videos that I'd done for O'Reilly, so those kind of things uh, tend to follow you around, I guess. And so that's exactly what today is. Mark and I still teach a class on the O'Reilly Learning Platform called Software Architecture by Example, because some people like to read all the details, but some people like to see kind of driven by example, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do today. And I want to use this idea that was developed by a clever architect about 15 years ago, this idea of an architecture kata. It solves this problem of how do you practice architecture? Because the way you get better at anything in life is practice. How often do you get to practice designing new architectures? Almost never. So how are you supposed to get better at it if you never get a chance to practice? That's the idea of an architecture kata. Uh, we have a number of these on our website. In fact, we use these when we teach uh, our software fundamentals class. Uh, but this is an example of a kata. It has a catchy name, a short description. So this is an auction company that wants to take their auctions online. So this is not like eBay. This is a real in-person auction, but we're adding an online component for you know reasons like a pandemic or something. So we have hundreds of participants per auction. So we'd like to scale up to potentially thousands at some point and as many simultaneous auctions as possible. The requirements, we're live streaming these as a video stream so they see the live uh, stream and they see bids as they occur. We're trying to make these as real time as possible given the constraints of the web and browsers and et cetera, but we want it to capture the feel of an auction as much as possible. Both online and live bids must be received in the order they're placed. Bidders register with a credit card and we bill them, of course, if they win, we can use a third party service to do that. And participants must be tracked via reputation index. We don't want people showing up and uh, you know, bidding, running up the price, then disappearing, or bidding and not paying, et cetera. So we want to try to track some of that uh, social media style. A lot of these katas also have some additional context that would drive your decision uh, that are not necessarily requirements. So for example, this company is expanding aggressively overseas. Uh, and if the nationwide auction is a success, they're going to replicate it uh, overseas. Uh, and they're merging with smaller competitors as well. We're not really budget constrained here uh, because this is a strategic direction and they just exited a lawsuit alleging fraud. So, you know, might influence your decision somewhat. So what we're talking about, what we're illustrating here today is a fairly narrow part of the software architect's job, but the one that is always associated with software architects, which is structural design in software architecture. And to do structural design and software architecture for a brand new problem like this, you have to do two activities. It doesn't really matter which order you do these activities in, but you need both of the outcomes of these two activities to feed into a fundamental decision, which is what is the starting point for the architectural style that I'm gonna choose for this architecture? Uh, and so we're gonna pick the order that we chose in our book, in fact, the first uh, half of the first section of our book concerns the first part of this design uh, stuff, which is uh, determining what your architecture characteristics are. 
So you have a problem of some kind, like going, going, gone. Uh, so you have requirements. And we just read through the requirements for going, going, gone. And that's absolutely part of your structural design that you're going to have to do. And that's what we're going to do next, the logical architecture design. But you've also got to design for a bunch of other stuff. And that other stuff is what Mark and I refer to as architecture characteristics. Some people call them non-functional requirements, which we don't like as a name because non-functional is kind of bearing the lead in newspaper speak. If you go to your boss and say, we need to work on the non-functional, it doesn't really matter what the rest of that sentence is. You're not going to get a lot of traction on that. They're also called cross-cutting requirements, which is our, the one that we like okay, but it has the word requirements in it, which gets tangled up with business or domain requirements. Um, they're also called uh, system quality attributes, but that makes it sound more like a QA assessment rather than one of the first things you do in a software architecture. So one of the first things you need to do is identify what these architecture characteristics are, uh, the so-called illities of software architecture. Uh, Mark and I looked and couldn't find a really good definition for these things and a way to, to help influence the way you choose them. And so we came up with our own. And it, the definition's in three parts. The first part of this definition specifies a non-domain design consideration. So this is that split I was talking about before of the domain, which is the, the thing that's motivating your software. These are all the things other than that that are still required to be successful. These are things that influence some structural aspect of the design. So there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between requirements and architecture characteristics uh, because one set of architecture characteristics may generate a whole bunch of uh, a lead reflection to a whole bunch of requirements and vice versa. One requirement may yield a whole bunch of architecture characteristics. But these are things that influence structure uh, and your consideration about structure. And in particular at this point, do I need more than one set of architecture characteristics for the solution? In other words, does one part of my system need to be more performant and scalable or more secure than, than another part? Because that will then lead you to can I get by with a monolithic architectural style or do I have to go distributed because in a distributed architecture you can have multiple sets of architecture characteristics. And that's one of the delineating factors in a distributed architecture is the clustering of like architecture characteristics. Uh, and so we're looking for things that might influence that decision. Uh, the last of these criteria is critical or important to application success. And this is really more of a filtering criteria than anything else. Uh, because one of the problems, the difficulties of architecture characteristics is they are extremely synergistic, both with each other and with your problem domain. Which is another way of saying that when you change one of those, you influence the design and the outcome of a bunch of other things. For example, if I want to improve security in my application, I'm probably going to negatively impact performance because I have to do more on-the-fly encryption, more indirection for secrets hiding, and so these things get tangled up with each other and your domain. And there's no real way to pull them apart. And so if you support more and more architecture characteristics, it necessarily makes your solution more and more complex. And so you should be very wary as an architect of over-specifying these things. This is where over-engineering comes from in software architecture. Um, critical or important to application success. So, one of the constant pieces of advice you get in the architecture world is embrace simple design. Everybody advises you to do that, but nobody ever tells you how to do that. Well, I'm telling you how to do that, and it supports less stuff because your domain is going to have a certain level of complexity, and if you can find just enough of these to be able to support and design for, then you have more complexity left over for your domain and you don't soak it all up with these things. Now, while there are only three of these, there's also a modifier that we laid over the top of these, which is, uh, well, there's your pathway to a simpler design. A modifier that we laid over the top of these for implicit versus explicit architecture characteristics. Explicit ones are, as they sound like, things that are explicitly called for, like a certain number of users or a certain level of performance or scalability, et cetera. But architects also design for implicit characteristics. These are things that influence your decisions, even if they're not specifically written down. Security, 
is a great example of one of those. Because even if you know, and it's not written down as part of your requirements, you know as an architect you should not design an insecure system. But there are other more subtle ones as well, like internal code quality, like the things from clean architecture and good internal a hygiene in terms of a code quality and coupling, et cetera. Uh, those are all things that um, you know you should design for as an architect, but you're probably never going to get an index card that says, please don't mess up the internal structure of the application as you build it. But that's kind of, kind of an implicit part of your job, and so those things go into this determination as well. That domain sits and rests on top of this. And we designed this as a, a triangle on purpose because it sort of implies imbalance and that they're balancing because that's exactly what these things are. Because these architecture characteristics are synergistic with each other, they often get tangled up with each other and influence each other. So one of the things that Mark and I talk about is we try not to talk about the best design because best implies that you've maximized all these things. Instead, we talk about the least worst design what's the least worst combination of trade-offs that we can get by with, because that's often what you're shooting for in architecture, not the perfect solution, which doesn't exist, but what's the least worst set of compromises that we have uh, to make this thing work. So let's talk about a few of these uh, architecture characteristics and some really special ones in particular, this family of what we call operational architecture characteristics. These are things like performance, scalability, elasticity, reliability, data integrity, etc. cetera. Uh, these are important because uh, in modern architectures like microservices, this is where roles like operations and architecture and DevOps meet because you have to design for scalability, but you have to have operational support for scalability as well. And so there's a lot of collaboration that needs to happen between these. And it's a good example of that these architecture characteristics are often not completely owned by architects. They influence other parts of the ecosystem as well. I mentioned these quality architecture characteristics like uh, controlling, coupling, and of course security is a great example of one of these. Uh, so let's apply this by example. This thing is called by example after all. So let's take out our architecture decoder ring and look at these requirements and see if we can determine what some architecture characteristics that are lurking down within here might be. And so one of these is, okay, we want to take these auctions online, and auctions need to be as real time as possible. So what does that imply in terms of these architecture characteristics? Well, some level of availability. I mean, it's got to be available for people to log on to it and, uh, and uh, bid on my auction. Reliability, we don't want it to disappear if you're halfway through an auction and it suddenly drops your connection, you have to reconnect. That's one part of reliability. Data reliability is another part. And of course, we have to trust an auction if we're doing that. And at least some level of performance. Understanding the limits of trying to do something real time in a browser, but it does need to be uh, snappy enough to uh, simulate a real browser uh, experience. That seems like a, a, good, uh, a good thing to have. Sometimes you're lucky. And the thing you need is actually more or less written down. We want to go to a nationwide scale, scale up to hundreds of participants per auction. What is this suggesting? Scalability, of course. It's right there written down for you. Uh, this is easy to find. But it's not just scalability. There's a, uh, a friend to scalability called elasticity. So let's talk for a second about of what the difference between scalability and elasticity are because it's pertinent here. Scalability is typically defined as the ability to support a certain number of concurrent users at the same time, and that number can go up, and that's the measure of how scalable you are. Implicit with that is a certain performance that as your scalability goes up, your performance doesn't fall off a cliff. It may go down a little bit, but it is reasonable, so that's a measure of scalability. You often measure those two things together. That's scalability, which more or less models even uh, ebb and flow of amount of traffic. Versus elasticity, which is all about bursty traffic. So uh, we saw a great example of this during the pandemic for the vaccination sites. 
they come online and they immediately get hammered into nothing because of scalability problems, because they can't scale enough to have the elasticity. Uh, this is a burst of users like concert ticketing site or you know, vaccination sign-up sites where you get 10,000 new users showing up all in a second. Now, we don't need that level here, but think about the nature of an auction. As an auction is going on, does it stay nice and calm and steady throughout the entire auction? Or as the auction gets closer to the end, does it get more and more hectic and more and more people show up to try to snipe? And that's exactly elasticity. So we're gonna probably need to support at least some level of both scalability and elasticity for the system. Bidders register with a credit card and the system automatically charges that card if the bidder wins. What's that one? This one couldn't be easier. Security, of course. We're dealing with money and we need to deal with uh, something like security and make sure that that's handled uh, correctly. Uh, but that's sort of an implicit characteristic because remember we're looking for things that influence structure and security is a good example of one of those things that can either be handled by structure for example, creating a hardened service that has particular access, but you can also fix it with design and not necessarily architecture, with really good governance. In fact, uh, one of the things that I talk a lot about is automated governance around things like security and other important things, even within monolithic systems. And so security may not necessarily influence the monolith versus distributed question because that's a good example of something that can be handled either architecturally or through design, with, of course, trade-offs uh, on either side of those. Both online and live bids must be received in the order in which they're placed. This is something I'm calling concurrency, because this is one of the things our solution is going to have to manage, because now we're multiplexing live bids and the online bids, and we've got to make sure that architecturally we can guarantee this, because this is part of of what the system uh, uh, really needs to do. Now, let's do one last one here. Nope. Right, let me go back. Oh, that's why. I hit the wrong button, that's why. There's one last one here. I can get the fancy highlighter work. Yeah. Participants must be tracked via a reputation index. What kind of architecture characteristic is that? Mostly when I ask that question, people immediately go to, how would you implement that? Traceability, logability, auditability, or something like that. But it's a trick. Because it's not an architecture characteristic at all. It's part of your problem domain. Because what does a reputation index mean? I don't know, this is something my business analysts have made up. There's your first clue. This is not something like elasticity that was well-defined. This is something they've cooked up. Remember, we're not designing the whole architecture right here. We're just looking for the structural part, the kind of beams that support all of the important structure. We're going to design all the stuff that needs to happen from a domain standpoint here. And one of the ways that you can, a litmus test for determining, is this something about an architecture characteristic or is this just part of the domain, is can you describe it in purely architectural abstract terms or do you need domain knowledge? And this is clearly something we need domain knowledge for because reputation index is not something that exists in the world. This is something we've cooked up and so this is going to be part of your design. So, and of course, that's always a spectrum and, and that can go back and forth, but in general, that's a good way to think about these things from a purely abstract architectural standpoint. For example, elasticity the ability to handle a burst of new users. Those could be users for a video store or a game or a catalog site, and so that's a good uh, candidate for one of these architecture characteristics. Okay, so we've come up with a reasonably good list of architecture characteristics. Uh, this is always iterative, so you're not punished if you don't get this right, and this is really just an influence. So I don't want to give you the impression here that we're choosing these things a la carte, because we're not which is why most ranking exercises for these things at this point are not very useful. They are actually useful for your business people because you're going to get them into room and say, which of these is the most important one? And every one of them is going to turn out to be the most important one. 
And so having them think through, oh, that there are trade-offs, that you can't have all these things and that you might have to have trade-offs is useful. But it's not that useful from a technical standpoint to prioritize them because you can't choose them a la carte. We are trying to build up a collection of facts about this to influence which architectural style is going to be the starting point for our solution. These styles, which I'll talk about in a second, are these named topologies because almost no architecture out in the world is exactly a microservice architecture, but a lot of them start as a microservice architecture. And that's what we're looking for. What is the starting point that looks most like our problem so that we can actually build out our solution in the most suitable architecture style? Because you can solve almost any problem in almost any architecture style. The question then becomes how difficult is it to solve this problem in this style? And you don't want to choose one that is exactly opposite of your problem and fight it uh, every step of the way, unless you're just looking for a really frustrating hobby and you have a lot of uh, budget to uh, burn through. So, having said that, we now have a reasonably good first iteration of these architecture characteristics. Uh, now let's uh, tackle the other half of what we need to do, which is that logical architecture or domain design. And this is a flowchart that describes what we're gonna do here. Identify initial components, assign requirements to components, look for roles and responsibilities, analyze those roles and responsibilities to see how well they fit into the, uh, the components that you've created here, analyze architecture characteristics, see if they influence the structure and the granularity of what you've created here, and then restructure and iterate. We're big believers on iterative design because I don't know any architects who are so clever that they can look at a complex problem and the correct granularity of components just falls out of their head. But you can start and start iterating and, and find and shrink and grow, et cetera. So let's look at what this looks like and identify some initial components here. One of the things you have to watch out for, and I was uh, teaching a class recently where a group fell right into this trap and it's an easy one to fall into. We have auctions, we have items, and we have bids. Well, I could just create an auction manager to create auctions, browse auctions, and schedule auctions, an item manager to create items, display items, and upload images, and a bid manager to place bids, display bids, and track bids. This is not an architecture. This is an entity relationship diagram. And if this is all you need in your system, then you don't need an architecture. You need to go download a framework that you can just point to a bunch of tables and it will build you a system on top of it. And there are a bunch of them that do that. In fact, Grails, which is based on Groovy, uses a reflective uh, OR mapper that you basically point it to a database and it'll build you like you know simple UI components and that kind of stuff. That's not what an architecture is. And this is a common trap to fall into. And in fact, microservices are not entities. Because if they were just modeling entities, that means to make them do useful work, you have to wrap them up in transactions and you try to avoid transactions across services within that ecosystem. So the danger words here are things like a manager or workflow or uh, what are some of the other uh, bad names here that indicate that you are a controller sometimes, is that you're just lumping everything in an entity plus something uh, together. That's really not what you're after in most modern architectures where you're trying to model some flavor of a domain or workflow rather than individual entities. Because the problem with modeling entities like this is that you have to glue them together and the more that glue expands in your architecture, the harder and the more coupled everything becomes. And one of our overarching goals in architectures these days is not to create big coupling mats or big coupling messes. Another way to do this is a workflow approach, and this is quite similar to domain-driven design and event storming. Look at the kind of activities that need to happen within this system and start creating components based on this. Something that creates auctions, something that allows browsing of auctions, something that allows registration, streaming, and bid capture, et cetera. This is uh, commonly tied to some sort of domain-driven design exercise uh, and event storming. But we're going to use a, slight, uh, a similar but slightly different approach that predates domain-driven design called this, this uh, actor-action approach. Uh, and both this and domain-driven design identifies roles and the kinds of things that roles are going to do. Uh, 
and treats a system as another role in this ecosystem. And so bidders in our world need to view live video streams, uh, view live bid streams and place bids. It's the primary function that they need to do. Auctioneers enter live bids into the system, uh, receive online bids and mark items as sold. And the system is the thing that kicks off an auction and makes payments and tracks bidder activity and also stops the auction as well. So given those bidders and those activities, let's start building some components. And this is a tricky part of architecture when there's nothing there already. This is the blank canvas problem because anything is possible at this point. So let's start looking at some of these. Start an auction. But which component that we already have should be responsible for starting an auction? Well, we don't have any components yet, so this is the easiest one so far. Let's create an auction session to manage that auction stopping and starting and that kind of stuff. Track bidder activity. Now the question is, should that be part of auction session or should this be its own component? Now you don't want to lump things together too much now, and that's a distinct activity from starting and stopping, et cetera. So that should, should probably be its own component. But notice it needs information from auction session as to when sessions have started and when to stop tracking bids, et cetera, because a particular auction's over. So now we're starting to see some dependencies between the components that we've created here in our architecture. What a bit of bitter live, a view live video stream. We don't have something that does anything about streaming yet, so that seems like a reasonably good new component. What about view live bid stream? New component or one of the existing ones? Now you may think, well, I've already got the video stream, and they both say stream in them, but that's not a good reason. These are very, very different kinds of things. What's the video stream gonna be? It's gonna be some kind of hyper-compressed kind of edge network crazy thing to try to make it as real time as possible. I don't want to get the bid stream tangled up in that because that's going to be like a JSON pump and it's going to be really simple. I don't want to tangle those things up just because they happen to say stream together. So yeah, definitely a different component. Uh, there's no reason to entangle these things uh, uh, inappropriately like that. What about placing a bid? One of our existing components or a new one? There's nothing here about placing bids yet, so bid capture. Oh. But bid capture, once it's been captured, needs to go to bid tracker and it needs to be able to strip, strip it back to the, the uh, bidder. So now we're seeing more dependencies between our components here. What about enter live bids into the system? New component or one of our existing ones? We've already got bid capture. Here's the first one we've been able to reuse because we're already capturing bids right there. So okay. Well, both those roles need to do a similar thing, so there's our bid capture component. So, all right, we've got some reuse. What about receive online bids? Yep, that's also bid capture, because as soon as you capture it, you can go and make sure that you capture it, both the online and the other one, and that can be reconciled right there in bid capture, so that's really nice. What about mark item is sold? That's our session. That's the thing that ends the auction. This is the ending event of the auction. So there is our auction uh, marking things as sold. What about make payment? Existing component or brand new one? Yep, there's nothing about payment there and we probably want to isolate that, but it does, needs to know about auction session, it needs to know when auction ends, et cetera. It needs to know some details uh, that's being passed back and forth between these guys. And so that's a reasonable first pass at uh, a component structure for this architecture. Now, notice that we haven't gotten any real details yet, but this is the next iteration. You're gonna take each of these components and actually start thinking about, okay, what kind of classes would go in here to make this possible? What libraries could we use for video streaming, et cetera? But we're not done yet. You'll notice, let me pause for just a second, and notice the way we've modeled this with sticky notes. This is really important at this early stage of architecture. Uh, there's something I blogged about several years ago, which I called irrational artifact attachment. That there is a proportional, an inversely proportional relationship to uh, how much time it took to create some sort of drawing and willingness to change that drawing. 
So if this is a really fancy drawing that took you two weeks to make and somebody says, well, that's wrong, it should be different, you go, no, nah, no. Nah. It took me way too long to create that. I'm not touching it. It's just perfect the way it is. If you've got sticky notes, nobody gets excited and defensive about sticky notes. You just wad them up and throw them away. And it's actually really important at this early stage of architecture is don't oversell how far you are. So there's this great little tool that we've been using a lot lately called Excaladraw. It's this little free shared whiteboard thing, but the most beautiful thing about Excaladraw is that all of the lines and all of the fonts look kind of rough and analog like it's a rough sketch. And it is the perfect tool for prototypes because when you show it to business people, they don't think you're almost done. So the really snappy OmniGraph or Visio diagram, it's like, wow, you're almost done with that thing. No, you want to convey that we're iterating at this point and we're not done. In fact, we're not even done here because we've only taken one step through that loop. Remember this stage. Analyze architecture characteristics. Here's a question for you. Remember when I was talking about architecture characteristics before, I said one of the things to look out for are different clusterings of architecture characteristics. Here's a question for you. How many auctioneers do I have? One per auction. How many bidders do I have per auction? Aspirationally, hundreds. I need good scalability for my bidders, but I don't need that for my auctioneer. There's only ever going to be one auctioneer. What about reliability? Now, certainly as a bidder, it's annoying if your connection drops halfway through the auction, you have to re-log back on and get back in the queue. But if the auctioneer drops, it's disaster because the auction's over and the company can't make money anymore. The point of this is that by looking at the architecture characteristic clusterings of behaviors, you can see that this is not sufficient. Because from a domain standpoint, bid capture is what we need to do here, but we need two bid captures because one needs to have a completely different architecture characteristic profile than the other one. One needs sky high reliability, but no scalability at all. The other needs scalability and whatever reliability we can get, but we can sacrifice other things for that. And so we need auctioneer capture and online bid capture. This is why it's useful to go through both of those exercises as you're doing your architectural design, because this is now, we know for a fact, this is going to be a distributed architecture. I cannot easily implement this in a monolith because I have two different clusters of architecture characteristics. So at the very least, I'm gonna have some part of my architecture that is reliable and singular for the bidder and some other part that is really scalable and elastic for all of my bidders. And there may be other parts as well. Because now that I know I'm in distributed architecture land, well now that probably suggests that auto payment may be isolated because it's the part that deals with money. And now structurally I can design architecture around the security for things like auto payment. And so this gives me a lot of input into what I should initially design. Once you get past the sticky notes phase of this architecture, then you can start actually creating some components for it. And these are just one-to-one -one mappings from uh, the sticky notes that we ended up with and the components and their relationships. Including some uh, uh, dependencies and information flow uh, between these components. So now we have the information we set out for. Because now we have enough information, we have a pretty good first iteration about what components we need. We've gone through the architecture characteristics analysis, and we now know we need a distributed architecture. Now let's start thinking about what the good starting point would be. One of the things that Mark and I created in our fundamentals book would be star charts for all these different architectural styles. What we did was choose a bunch of desirable architecture characteristics on the left there, agility, deployment, testability, et cetera. And for each of these architecture styles, we did a qualitative assessment of them as to how way those support one thing versus the other. 
And the only one of these that's really confusing, and, and I, I mean to update this with dollar signs, total cost at the bottom, large number of stars means good, which means low total cost, which is very confusing, I know, and I apologize. We're going to change that with uh, dollar signs and make it a lot more uh, uh, intelligible at some point in the future. But the rest of these are uh, fine the way they are. And this is really just a, a qualitative comparison to say, you know what, microservices are way more scalable than monoliths in general. Which is not to say that anything with Herculean effort can't be made to do something. Uh, this is what the general trends are uh, for these architecture styles. And so if I know I'm in distributed architecture land, that means I can go ahead and mark those off automatically. Those are monolithic architectures, really hard to support, support the different behaviors for uh, auctioneer and bidder in that kind of architecture. So that leaves me these four as reasonably good candidates. I won't talk about space base so much here because it's a super specialized just for elasticity and uh, but it's a, it's a very detailed so I won't get into it very much uh, just in the interest of time. Microservices is definitely one of the candidates that we would think about here. It is the modern cool kid distributed architecture. We did a very domain centric design and of course this is based on domain driven design and so the component design that we just did would facilitate very nicely mapping into these kind of workflows that we have in uh, microservice architecture. This is a distributed architecture, so we could easily model this to have bidder stuff and auctioneer stuff be very separate. One of the benefits of this architecture is a high degree of decoupling. The defining characteristic and the thing that really distinguishes microservices from all the other distributed architectures is this is the only one that tries to honor that idea from, from domain-driven design of bounded context. And the side effect of that is that the data is part of the service boundary and it is highly decoupled from all the other parts of the architecture. So in general, you don't share data, and certainly databases across service boundaries, which gives you an extremely high degree of decoupling because now I can change the internals of one of those services without worrying about breaking anything else because nothing else is allowed to couple to the implementation details. They can still pass messages through uh, message queues or synchronously through other uh, transport protocols, but that's really the distinguishing characteristic of microservices. And that's what makes it so difficult because uh, transactionality now is an architectural concern. And that's why the entity trap leads you into a bad place. Because if you model things just as entities and create basically an architecture that's an, an, an ORM mapping, at some point the entities have to play together to create a workflow and they need transactional behavior and now you're trying to get transactional, uh, distributed transactions to work and you don't want to be there. Uh, it's much easier to model the service boundaries around the transaction versus trying to overlay the transaction across those entities. So events are often used in this architecture because while it's extremely scalable, it is often not the most performant architecture in the world because there's a lot of overhead in pushing data around at the network level rather than inside a monolith. And so a well-tuned monolith is actually more performant but nowhere near as scalable as this. Uh, but scalability is really important for us and this also gives us good elasticity. So that's definitely a, one of the candidates that we would think for uh, our uh, our solution because as you can see here has really really good scalability really good elasticity in fact some of the best of any of the architectures that you talk about but another candidate that we could think about as well is most often the target of architectural migrations when you're going from a monolithic architecture into a distributed architecture a service-based architecture, which is the only topology that Mark and I gave our own name to, but we felt compelled to do that because it's one of the commonest architectures that you see out in the world right now. And so it is philosophically inspired by microservices. It's just a little more pragmatic because it's really hard if you have an existing database with you know, relationships and triggers and all that stuff, really, really hard to break that apart into uh, all those little tiny databases um, that are required by microservices. In fact, some of you may have, uh, in this migration exercise, may have gone through this exercise where you as the architect go to where all the DBAs are virtually sitting now and you say, hey, it's great to see all of you. I haven't seen you since the virtual Christmas party. And 
hey, you know that big relational database schema you've been carefully stitching together for the last 10 years? Now we want you to take it and blast it apart in a whole bunch of little bitty tiny domain databases and all that referential integrity, don't worry, I'm sure we'll be able to handle that at the application level. I mean, what could go wrong? Oh, and by the way, we're going to need some help setting up backup and restore for about 50 more databases than the ones you're dealing with now. When do you think you'll be done with that? It's just not going to be a great conversation in a lot of organizations. And a lot of teams realize that, look, the database is a big giant coupling point. We know it's a big giant coupling point. We've lived with it as a big giant coupling point forever. And there's very little value for going through the exercise of pulling it apart just for the access, for the uh, for pulling it apart. Uh, and so typically a service-based architecture has a single relational database rather than trying to be so strictly adherent to the bounded context philosophy in microservices. Uh, the other thing that's quite different in a service-based architecture is bigger services. And the goal in microservices is a service should be a bounded context and very small workflow. That's really hard to get to from a practical standpoint if you are coming from an existing code base. I mean, the big domain chunks are pretty easy to separate, but it's all the little shared address classes and other things that you have to figure out. Where do those go? Do I couple to them? Do I duplicate them? It's just easier to have a bigger boundary for those things. And so, uh, you have generally a smaller number of services. Um, and it gives you a good uh, mig uh, migration target if you're going from a monolith to a service-based architecture because when you think about this, this is really reflects a philosophical change that we've, we've undergone over the last few years. Uh, the traditional layered architecture there on the left, uh, which you're all quite familiar with, where does domain con a domain concept like catalog checkout live in the layered architecture. Well, parts in the presentation layer and parts in business rules, parts in persistence, parts in the database. And so you've basically taken that domain concept and smeared it out across those technical layers. Whereas in a service-based architecture and in microservices, you're trying to model the domain as the first class citizen. And so in many cases, this exercise of monolith to service base is turning the architecture inside out. It's taking those smeared out domains across the layers and making those the top first class citizens and maybe layers inside each of those, but the top level partitioning is around domains and workflows, not around uh, technical capabilities. Uh, so how suitable is this for something like going, going, gone? Uh, I mentioned this as a common migration target, but the last two big projects that I've worked on, this has been the architecture style that we chose because we didn't need to break the data down any further. One database was plenty scalable enough for what we needed, and it added a lot of complexity to break it down further. And so this is often a, a pragmatic choice. But maybe not for going, going, gone, because we really need different sets of architecture characteristics, and that's gonna be kind of hard to do against a single database, we might benefit from having uh, multiple databases. So that, but that's definitely a possibility uh, that we can think about. And certainly when you look at performance and scalability and elasticity, these are not as good as in the microservices world, and that's one of the things we really need, and so that's something that we'll have to definitely think about. Now one of the options on my list here is an event-driven architecture. Uh, and this is one of those places where events can be used as both an architecture style and a communication pattern. And this is a good time to talk about the distinction between an architecture style and an architecture pattern. A style is a named topology, a relationship between components, and that often comes with a bunch of default characteristics. Whereas a pattern is something that, that can exist within a style. So CQRS, for example, which is a persistence pattern, you can implement CQRS on virtually any one of the architecture styles that we've been talking about. And this is a great place to make that distinction because you often use event-driven communication patterns within microservices, but it can also be its own architecture style, meaning that you're building an architecture just on top of events and message queues, et cetera. Um, the analogy that I use for this is that you're all, I'm sure, familiar with prefabricated houses. 
that's a house where they've already basically studded in the walls and already put the windows in and the frame and all that. And they basically pour the foundation, show up, and nail the walls together and put a roof on it. And within a week, you can have a new house. That's a microservice architecture because people have already built all the scaffolding for you. You can download libraries and frameworks. And, and exactly the same for a prefabricated house, if you're building it on a standard lot for a standard kind of house, that's the fastest, easiest way to get a house put together. Same is true if you're building some sort of system that needs kind of standard elasticity or, or scalability and you can use service mesh and all these capabilities to do that with microservices. But what if you have a really weird lot or you want to build a really weird house? Nobody's prefabricating the weird ones. So you got to build it, you got to go to a lumber store and buy all the stuff yourself. That's an event-driven architecture because this lets you fine-tune the combination of performance and scalability and a whole bunch of other things that are really hard to get to in the other styles, but because this is so simple and primitive, you really can fiddle with and change a bunch of the ways uh, that this works. And so this takes more time to build than a microservice architecture, but it often gives you capabilities that you can only get if you go all the way down to the atomic level. There are two different styles of uh, event-driven architecture that are commonly used here as architecture styles. One of them is a broker, which means that there is no common mediator. This is purely event-driven. When events occur, these things react to those events and then uh, send off messages that other events react to. For example, if you're modeling something like a buying a book in an architecture like this, uh, you get a, uh, an initiating event there for an order, which goes into an order placement component. Uh, it posts a message that says, hey, I've created an order. Is anyone interested in that? Uh, both payment and inventory are interested in that, so they'll both pick that up. Payment will post a payment and then post a message saying it was denied if it can't be paid. If it was applied, they'll post an applied. And so you can see that the, the workflow is just sort of organic throughout this architecture, which is both positive and negative. Very easy to add new stuff, pretty hard to understand. The other topology that's common in event-driven architectures is a mediated event-driven architecture, which has all the same bits that we saw before, but with that event mediator in place. Now, this is uh, dozens of different implementations of this in software architecture, but just as a pattern, what a mediator does is allow you to control the workflow of all of these other subservient event processors and maybe do pseudo-transactional coordination, but at least tell them you know, what the workflow is and error conditions and that sort of stuff. And so placing an order for a book here, do I have an animation for this one? Yes, I do. Yep, so you create an order, the mediator knows what steps to go through, so it can go tell order placement. These are more commands than events because the mediator now is issuing commands to say, okay, now place this order, do this stuff, coordinate all these things, manage errors, etc. So, suitability for pure event-driven architecture for going, going, gone. So the real question we have here is, are there parts of going, going, gone so unique that we need to build them from scratch, or is this a lot that looks like we could build a standard ranch kind of architecture on? I'm mixing metaphors like crazy there, but I think you get the idea. So we'll knock out service-based right away because it doesn't really have that set of uh, characteristics that we really want. And we're not going to talk about space-based uh, in the interest of time. Space-based is an interesting thing, uh, but it's a very esoteric, very complex architecture that gets rid of the database and allows you to handle like 10,000 brand new concurrent users at once, which is a really slick thing to have. But we don't need that level of elasticity here, and we have transactional kind of stuff which kind of knocks space-based out. So we're left with microservices and event-driven and in fact, we're gonna combine these two. We're gonna use the microservice topology and use events internally as a communication pattern. So this is not really mixing the two styles. Microservices is going to be the style of architecture, including data fidelity, but we're gonna use events to handle some of the issues like concurrency and some other stuff. And so that means that we take our logical component diagram and turn it into services. At this point, you determine where should persistence and state 
be in this architecture. Because notice some of these are just coordinators and don't need databases and state, but some of them do because they need to coordinate state. So this is, <coughs> excuse me, from a topological standpoint, a microservices architecture. And we're using events internally to manage some of the complexity. So notice that we're using queues in a couple of key places here, like uh, my online bid capture and my bid tracker uh, and my queue here. One of the things that we have to worry about is, okay, online bid capture. What happens if a whole bunch of people all bid the same number at the same time? Well, it's not going to be exactly the same time. It'll be separated by microseconds. And if we use a message queue there that is strictly ordered in the order that they get things, we can just let it tell us who the winning bid is and actually throw all the other ones away. So all the 100s, as soon as the first one hits the queue, the rest of them we can get rid of. And so we can manage all that at the queue and unify all those things for bid tracker service using the natural uh, characteristics of uh, an event queue. Uh, so this allows us to leverage some things in the event world that already exist, like durable message queues and, and FIFO to make sure that you get the first one in. And that actually solves some of our interesting concurrency problems in our architecture. And uh, this is a good first iteration of our architecture. Now, the next thing that you would do from this point is to start looking at transactionality. Are there any transactions that need to span across these service boundaries? And if there are, then I may need to revisit these. In fact, so these are, this is where we ended up in the fundamentals book. But in the software architecture, the hard parts book, we go a little bit further and define uh, what we call integrators and disintegrators for microservice architectures. Disintegrators are things that encourage you to, make, to break these things down into smaller pieces. But integrators are things that encourage you to bundle them back together. And, and transactionality is one of those integrators that if you break things down too small and create headaches for yourself for, because of distributed transactions, then you use that integrator to bundle it back together. And really the only time you can't do that is if you legitimately need different characteristics for the two parts of that uh, that you're trying to bundle together. So that's an example of a software architecture uh, by example. There are a whole bunch of more katas here if you're interested. This is the Fundamentals of Software Architecture uh, website. This is the companion to our book. All the diagrams in our book are on this site uh, too, by the way, uh, for uh, bizarre historical reasons. Uh, if you are interested in podcasts, I'm the uh, sometimes host of the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast. I actually was lucky enough recently to get to interview several really fascinating people, including Dave Farley, who was the uh, co-author of the Continuous Delivery book and worked on LMAX. Um, so uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, uh, uh, that's available. Uh, this is the stuff that, from the Fundamentals book, the next chapter of the difficult parts in software architecture. I've talked about some of those in my keynote this morning. And I'm going to leave you with a fantastic resource that if you don't know about, this is going to make this whole conference trip worth your while. This is Mark, my co-author's website, uh, developeratarchitect.com. One of the things that Mark has been doing for almost a uh, little over two years now are these little uh, lessons that he releases every two weeks, five to ten minute video about some concept in software architecture. He's up to about number 200 of those now, and I take partial responsibility for the presence of these videos, even though I have not lifted a single finger toward helping him create any of these videos. Because I understand how Mark's mind works. And two years ago, when Mark said, I'm gonna start recording these little lessons and put them online every couple of weeks, I said, there's no way you'll be able to keep that up. And to spite me, he has been doing it for over two years now. So as a public service, to the software architecture community, I will periodically annoy Mark and claim that he'll never be able to keep this up and he'll keep this up uh, forever and ever and we'll have this fantastically a great resource. So my last piece of advice, go do some architecture. It's not a spectator sport. There are a bunch of katas up there on our website. Go through and work through some of these issues because the only way you get better at something 
is to actually go and do it. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.